Good afternoon. Uh, we're happy to be here with you this afternoon. We're going to give it just another minute or two and let the participants join the webinar before we uh, launch into our exciting discussion today. Thank you. If you're just joining us, just giving it another minute to let some participants get into the webinar here and we will uh, begin presenting here in a minute or so. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my clock showing 315, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. We have a really exciting panel lined up for you this afternoon um, to talk about affordable housing strategies in Utah. I'm Angela Price. I am the Legislative Committee Co-Chair for the American Planning Association Utah Chapter, and I'm also a Policy and Project Manager for the Housing and Neighborhood Development Division with Salt Lake City. I'm honored to be here with uh, many of my friends and colleagues this afternoon to talk about what is a very poignant um, topic within our communities right now. We have over 170 um, participants registered for this webinar this afternoon with a wide range of backgrounds, including the media, uh, the legislature, municipal um, planners and um, development directors. We have the development community, banks, um, so we're really excited that we have a, a very diverse group of um, participants this afternoon here listening to this very important discussion. Real quickly, I'm going to go over the agenda and then talk to you for just a minute about some of the uh, affordable housing strategies that we're working on in Salt Lake City. We have Tara Rollins with the Utah Housing Coalition here this afternoon to talk about the housing affordability gap. Ari Bruning with Envision Utah will be discussing public attitudes towards affordable housing. Ted, Noten, Ted Knowlton, our very own APA Utah president and deputy director for Wasatch Front Regional Council will be discussing regional perspectives on affordable housing. And then Evis Garcia and Reed Ewing representing the University of Utah City and Metropolitan Planning Department will be discussing their uh, 10 city survey of state of the practice in Utah. Salt Lake City has, um, in 2018, we adopted our Modern Income Housing Plan, which is called Growing SLC. Growing SLC serves as the framework for all of our housing policy um, and development decisions within the city. We, within Growing SLC, we've identified three goals that serve as the framework. And within those goals, we've identified numerous objectives to help us obtain those, those goals. They are reforming city practices to promote and preserve a responsive, affordable, high opportunity housing market, increase housing opportunities for cost burden households and build a more equitable city. We are uh, two and a half years into our housing plan and I'm happy to report that we've accomplished many of the goals and objectives that we set out to accomplish just two and a half years ago. Some of those goals that we've been working towards is our RDA over the past 10 years has invested over $64 million in the creation of almost 2,500 housing units, over 1,300 of which are accessible and available to residents that are 80% AMI or below. We've had such a huge investment in housing in Salt Lake 
thanks to our tax increment financing and our housing developer trust fund. In addition to that, our planning department has been doing a lot of um, heavy lifting in revising our zoning ordinance. Currently, our planning division is working on an affordable housing overlay. I'll post a link um, to that website in the chat so you can take a look at it. But um, the overlay is currently in a public process to determine if, um, if the residents of Salt Lake City would like to encourage the development of affordable housing through development incentives and what that looks like. The, about two a year and a half ago, the planning division also passed an ADU ordinance that allows ADUs within the city as a conditional use permit. We're currently working on revising our housing loss mitigation ordinance. And over the past few years, we have seen parking reductions in an effort to reduce development costs and impact, we, impact fee waivers for affordable housing development. Um, at any time, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the work that we're doing in Salt Lake and our modern income housing plan. With that, I would love to turn the time over to Tara Rollins with the Utah Housing Coalition. I, I think that um, we have a really great panel here today. And um, as we all are working on implementing SB 34 and updating our modern income housing plans, land use elements and transportation elements, I think you will find this guide is a very helpful tool in, in helping you to accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I always like to start off with this slide because, you know, it just illustrates what you get for $500 a month, not much. Next. So as, um, I'm not gonna go through this whole report, but um, I'd like to um, make some statements around it. Housing is so much more than just a roof over one's head. Housing now represents much, much more. Housing is now part of our healthcare system as it is a place to stay healthy and prevent others from becoming infected. Our homes became our offices, relying on technology to conduct our work. Our homes are now classrooms, teachers coming in through technology to teach our children. Some of us are fortunate enough to have jobs that allow us to stay in place to work and stay healthy, but many without these privileges are the same people who provide the conveniences of our current reality. Many of our essential workers in a community who are depending on every day do not have the same privileges. These are our healthcare workers, our tech staff, grocery um, store workers, stockers, cashiers, cooks, delivery personnel, and many, many more. These workers are the backbone of our communities yet struggle every day to make ends meet and afford their housing. These people continue to go to work to make sure we have access to all we need to make it through difficult times. We need to help them get through their difficult times. A few weeks ago, the National um, Low Income Housing Coalition put out their out of reach report. And this is um, Utah's report. It's just a snapshot, a one page snapshot. And we'll be sharing with you um, after the event where you can go on and look at um, and the whole, all of the information in Utah and it drills down to every county um, and you can even get um, down to the zip code um, level. Um, so they, each year they put this report out and last year, just to highlight, you know, you needed to make $18 and 30 cents an hour to afford a two bedroom, a modest apartment. Um, and that's in the state of Utah. This year it went up $1.53. So now it's $19.83 an hour to afford the same apartment as last year. Wages are not keeping up with rental increases. Um, we have 70% of our extremely low income community members paying more than 50% of their income to housing. And you know, us housers, we always are throwing around, you know, 30%, 40%, 50%, 80%, etc. So just to let you know, um, oh, somehow I, I lost one of my pages, but anyway, I'll get to, to that. So in order, um, it's $24,805 a year that you have to make, and that's 30% of AMI. 
and it breaks down to about $11 an hour. So we have a lot of um, our workers making, you know, $11 an hour. Um, a lot of our um, at tourist workers um, are making that kind of money. We have a lot of jobs that, um, that are paying that. I don't even like to talk about the minimum wage, you know, in this particular report, because a lot, you know, a lot of people are making more than minimum wage. Um, and so I like to focus on more, you know, our backbone workers. Um, many say, why do we talk about two bedroom? You know, what about a one bedroom? That's not much difference. You know, you have to make $16 and um, 24 cents an hour um, to be able to afford that. You know, we feel that housing has taken a backseat in policy and planning priorities for a long time. And, you know, we're really starting to see some movement um, with that. And I think um, we have to commend, you know, the legislators for putting together the Commission on Housing Affordability. Um, they have really brought, um, you know, a a large group together with mixed interests. And I think the conversations have been very rich and um, blunt. And sometimes you don't wanna hear it, but I think those difficult conversations are being had and trying to figure out a way to move forward so we do have housing that people can afford. Um, and I believe that it is so important to our economy right now um, getting through the pandemic and making sure that we can get our economy, be, economy back on track. Um, we need to make sure that people have housing they can afford. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tara, for oh, and for your uh, hard work in the community. Um, next, we have Ari Bruning with Envision Utah. And I just real quickly that I, I forgot to mention, we're going to hold Q&A until the very end, but I encourage you if a question comes up um, during the presentation to go ahead and post it in the chat and we'll make sure to circle, circle back with you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of our data at Envision Utah um, related to the public's perceptions regarding housing in general. This is not specific to affordable housing, but I think it's relevant. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, most of this data is from an effort we did uh, from 2013 to 2015 that we called Your Utah, Your Future, where we were looking at uh, the state roughly doubling in population by 2050 and, and engaging the public to ask uh, how do they want to accommodate that growth and, what, and establish a vision across 11 topics, one of which was housing and cost of living. Um, so go to the next slide. Uh, we put together uh, four different scenarios for how we could develop in the greater Wasatch area. Um, and we varied the housing mix and where, how development was organized, is it in mixed use centers and so on, where we grow, what kind of transportation we build, shared with the public a lot of data about these different scenarios, including things like, what does the housing mix look like? What does the affordability look like? Um, and if you go to the next slide, the answer we got back was 78% chose one scenario. And if you think about that, um, it's hard to get 78% of Utahns to agree on anything. Uh, so <laughs> pretty remarkable that they uh, chose one scenario. And this, the scenario they chose was one that had the, the, the lowest uh, housing and transportation costs um, because of the mix of housing that was built and, and how it was located with the transportation. So if you'll go to the next slide, um, we followed this up with uh, a survey question where we said, okay, if this is what you want, are you willing to make some of the trade-offs that are required to get there? And one of the trade-offs we asked was uh, more communities will have to allow a variety of housing types other than large lot homes. And you'll see there, uh, people were fairly willing to make that trade-off, um, a little bit of hesitancy there, um, but generally, generally willing to do it. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we then, we then gave them 100 points and we asked them to allocate them across five different housing outcomes. Um, and this was the average number of points that people allocated to each one. Um, and you'll see what came out on the top was providing a full mix of housing types that maximizes how many people can afford decent housing. 
followed by improving the ability for those with lower incomes to live in desirable neighborhoods, improving opportunity for them and their children, and then reducing how much each household needs to spend on transportation. And if you look at what's dead last, uh, got the fewest number of points, was limiting how many apartments, townhomes, and low-income people and renters are in my community. So if you, if you look at this in context, at least when you're looking long-term and big picture, Utahns get the need for accommodating a full mix of housing and housing that people can afford um, throughout our neighborhoods and so on. Now, when you get to a, a specific project in a specific spot, you might get a little bit of a different reaction. Um, and toward that end, if you'll go to the next slide, um, we uh, did some survey work where we were trying to figure out what's the best way to talk about these housing issues. So we put together some potential messages about housing and asked people, do you find this compelling or not? And if you look at the top three messages here, they got at least 80% to say it's at least somewhat compelling. Um, the top one there is it makes it possible for teachers, firefighters, police officers, and other people who work in the, in the community to afford to live there. It's kind of this sense of fairness that if I work in that community, I should be able to live there. Um, the second one is about making it easier to live close to work, shopping, and other destinations, which leads to better air quality and less traffic congestion. So kind of a benefit to everybody. And then the third there has to do with kind of the heart of Utahns. It makes it so that people with lower incomes don't all have to live in lower income areas where schools struggle and it's hard to escape intergenerational poverty. So those three messages all performed pretty well. And as we talk about housing uh, are fairly compelling. So now my one last thought on this last slide, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, it's not just about housing, it's about where and how we place that housing and design it. Um, you know, affordability isn't just the housing cost, it's also the transportation cost um, and how easily you can get around without a car, for example. Um, where we put the housing also affects people's access to opportunity and their upward mobility. Are they able to get to good jobs and schools and so on? Um, you know, it affects things like congestion and air quality and the way we design it. And, um, and we, I was involved in a project in San Diego where they have an even bigger housing problem than we do. Um, and this, this thought about the ability for our friends and family to stay in Utah, um, we found that the number one value, the thing that people were worried about the most there was it's just so expensive that I don't know if my kids can stay here. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's kind of the compelling message, I think, that we need to get out in Utah. So with, with that, that's uh, some of our data about uh, how Utahns feel about housing in Utah. And I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Ari. That's really great data. And I think that you teed Ted up perfectly with his hashtag, where matters. Uh, he did indeed, and not a surprise, right? Uh, uh, Like-minded people sometimes uh, convey uh, similar things. Um, very much we're talking about how to uh, uh, respond to housing demands. Uh, but the where question really is a critical one, and Ari um, highlighted that really effectively. Now, this is a very unusual moment in time in Utah, isn't it? It's unusual, obviously, because of COVID-19 and what we're going through. Um, but if you take a step back and you look at, at this time in Utah's history, uh, it's important to remind ourselves, we have been the fastest growing state for the last 10 years. So um, just before COVID-19, you recall, the biggest topic uh, out there was uh, housing affordability, and it is returning to that. It's returning to that with this bizarre lens of COVID-19. Um, but the legislature acted in 2019, and they put in place something called uh, Senate Bill 34, getting at affordable housing. And a lot of communities are figuring out, well, hey, what do we do in, this, in the context of this bill? Um, and I think that's part of what Angela was talking about uh, at the front end of this. 
And a lot of people are focusing on this first item on, on the screen that you're looking at, which is there's a menu of options that uh, communities can pick from and then talk about how are they moving them forward. But there's, there's like a B side of greatest hits to Senate Bill 34 that isn't getting as much attention, but probably should. And a lot of that has to, has to do with where. So take a look at the second item. These are summaries um, and the references are there. Tie your moderate income housing element, that menu, uh, to the location of housing for residents of various income levels. Um, tie it to 3A, tie it to locations relative to active transportation, bicycling. 3B, tie it to the location of transit, not just where it is now, but where transit will grow. Um, think about how regional agencies, 3C and D, are uh, themselves planning for future transit. And how are you coordinating with those kinds of plans? Plans like uh, those that my agency uh, facilitates with local governments, UDOT and EPA, Wasatch Front Regional Council. And this gets back to the where matters question. So uh, Saudi, if you bring up the um, webpage, I'll wrap up my remarks here. Um, a lot of communities, I think sort of, I, I'm a planning commissioner. I sometimes hear these debates. It's, it's sort of the debate is should we have density in our community or not? And it's kind of the wrong debate. The right debate is what's the best place for workforce housing, for uh, teachers and police officers to live using uh, the language that we should be using? Um, what are those locations? And a lot of communities have answered that question with uh, the Wasatch Choice vision this question of what are those best locations for mixed uses, for uh, workforce housing, and how do they dovetail with a transportation plan? And so um, uh, the, my last thing to note is just that if you're a community and you're thinking about these questions, uh, where does it make sense? How do we make, uh, what, what makes sense in those locations that are the most strategic? And you're thinking, well, this is hard stuff. Uh, just be aware of the fact that there is help out there. There's a program called the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program, which is a partnership of uh, WFRC, UDOT, UTA, and Salt Lake County. And it's available uh, all the way from Brigham City, all the way to Bluffdale. And if you're outside of that area, there's a UDOT program called the Technical Planning Assistance Program that's there to help you. And that is, uh, that's my uh, remarks about Senate Bill 34 and where it matters. Back to you, Angela. Thanks, Ted. And thanks for all the great work that you guys are doing at WFRC. I highly encourage you to uh, peruse their website. They have some amazing data, awesome maps, and uh, some really good tools for SB 34 implementation. Next, uh, I'd love to turn the time over to Evis Garcia and Reed Ewing with the University of Utah City and Metropolitan Planning Department. Well, thank you, uh, Angela. So today we are going to be presenting a report that we created um, with PhD students and master's students at the Metropolitan Research Center. And the title of that report is Affordable Housing Strategies, a State of the practice in 10 uh, Utah cities. Uh, the methodology was uh, to look at plans, look at reports, look at websites, and see um, what uh, these 10 cities um, are doing in terms of like creating affordability in their communities. And those 10 cities are Salt Lake City, South Salt Lake, Provo, West Valley City, Oren, Park City, uh, Ogden, Sandy, West Jordan, and Lehigh. And we actually will be like sharing uh, these reports um, with everyone that is attending uh, this uh, webinar. So the report starts with some of the federal programs. Um, so here we are talking about low income housing tax credits, the new market tax credits, and the community investment um, tax credits or CRA. Um, but today we want to spend most of our time talking about um, more like local tools that are uh, being used 
by uh, these like cities in Utah. And we divided uh, these tools in three categories. So financial, um, here we are talking about tax abatements and tax increment financing uh, reimbursements. Then we have like pol policy or um, regulations. Um, so a lot of like what um, Ted and Ari and Angela were talking about more like uh, planning tools, um, like uh, reducing like parking requirements and things like that. And uh, finally, um, just like social or other strategies. And this is more um, things that have to do, for example, with like how to uh, battle not in uh, my backyard uh, movements. Okay, Th thank you, Yves, and, and thank you all for attending. Uh, the the uh, chart you see has X's and checks uh, it's based on work our students did, mostly master's students at the University of Utah in City and Metropolitan Planning. Uh, a check means that a particular a city uses a particular tool. An X means uh, that city does not use that particular tool. As you can see, there are a lot of tools and you're gonna see two other slides like this that increase the number. Uh, to over 20 uh, ways of producing affordable housing. And I guess the, the main point, we're gonna be talking about each of the tools on this particular slide, but I think the main point is that there are a lot of exits. Uh, and those are areas where we'd be kind of stretching a bit, but where we could do more to produce affordable housing uh, in our state. And I think uh, Ari's work, uh, they talked about the fact that it is a public priority. Affordable housing or housing affordability means we probably want to and can do more. So the first three is like um, waiving or reducing impact fees. So the impact fees that we are really talking about uh, is to pay for parks and other infrastructure in cities. So if you feel that build affordable housing at let's say 30%, 50%, 80% of the area median income, um, you pay uh, for community service. So the idea is that you will be uh, having a reduction in these fees according to like how deep um, you are offering um, affordability. Um, the impact fees might also vary based on housing location, for example, urban infield developments might command a lower fee than developments that are built in the suburbs, and then you have to build all kinds of infrastructure um, that doesn't uh, exist. Uh, there were like four of the cities that waive, um, reduce, or, or, or reduce the impact fees, including Salt Lake City, uh, Park City, Sandy, and South Salt Lake. Uh, for example, South Salt Lake, um, the 2010 general plan recommending waiving the park's impact fee if a developer of affordable housing decides to provide some open space that the residents can use um, in the development site. Okay, the next tool or strategy is tax abatement. And you'll, you'll notice from this next slide that um, zero of 10 uh, cities in our survey are, are giving tax abatements right now. Uh, by that, I mean uh, uh, providing a, an elimination or a reduction uh, in property tax for, uh, affordable, for affordable units. Um, you think of tax abatement more in terms of economic development, that uh, tax abatement uh, is used to attract, for example, uh, you know, high tech firms when you're competing with uh, other cities around the country, uh, it can also be used for affordable housing. And the examples we give in, in each of the chapters, there, there are the, um, the local examples, that is from the state of Utah, and then there are the national examples. And the example, a couple of examples we give in the national example category, since we don't have any uh, local examples, is New York City, which has a a robust program for multifamily buildings that are renovated or rehabilitated and follow specific affordable housing requirements. We talk about how that uh, program was, was implemented, uh, how many units are being covered, 
uh, by it and uh, so on. Uh, the, the other example we give uh, is Portland, Oregon, which has a, a tax incentive for rental uh, home rehabilitation. Uh, it also uh, supports construction of owner-occupied homes in certain opportunity areas uh, and nonprofit ownership of affordable rental units. And in a single year, 14,000 homes received a uh, tax abatement benefit. The tax increment on financing reimbursements of or TIF are a very popular mechanism for revitalizing blighted neighborhoods and just boosting economic development um, in that area and thus generating future property taxes. So these like future or expected property taxes are diverted and used in the TIF district um, today. Usually it's an area that is designated as eligible for TIF funds. Um, when like the government intervention intervention is really needed in that particular space, uh, so usually um, this will be designated by trying to find out um, if the area qualifies for uh, to be a community redevelopment um, area, and this is like uh, stated by the federal government. Uh, so most TIFs um, usually don't use affordable housing but like many cities are now trying to use it for affordable housing. Um, and this here in Utah, we have like Salt Lake City, Provo, West Valley, Park City, Ogden, West Jordan and Lehigh. So they try to promote um, TIFs uh, for affordable housing by uh, setting aside an amount of like 10 to 20% um, of the TIF for um, housing projects that are affordable. Uh, so in Salt Lake City, the TIF is managed by the uh, City Redevelopment Agency or RDA, uh, and TIFs could be uh, transferable from one district um, to another. Uh, for example, in our research, um, at least like last we found out, uh, the RDA designated the Northwest Quadrants as a community redevelopment um, area. And TIF is authorized, but as you may know, housing is not being built uh, in that particular space. Um, yet some of those like funds that are created could be used for affordable housing in other places um, in the city. In this case, at 10%. Okay, um, next one is local rent supplement or assistance programs. Uh, again, we have zero out of 10. I don't know why I ended up getting the slides with zero out of 10, but uh, this is one where uh, no one's doing it. Uh, we, we have federal subsidies, uh, which are responsible for the majority of rental assistance programs uh, nationally, uh, Section 8, for example, often administered through local housing authorities. But what we're, we're talking about here is where uh, the local government itself provides uh, for rental assistance for low-income families. Uh, it's particularly critical during periods of unemployment uh, and other unexpected difficulties. Uh, the pandemic is a, a classic in, in that sense, a good example of where it'd be nice to have this particular tool. Uh, our national example, or one of them, is Frederick County, Maryland, which has a rental allowance program, which provides rental assistance payments to low-income families during critical uh, or emergency time, uh, times. The assistance can last up to six months, and the goal of the program is to help during these transitional periods, uh, supporting people moving back into uh, a sense of self-sufficiency. Home purchasing assistance programs provide um, interest-free or very low interest loans to qualify low to moderate income home buyers. And this is one of the most popular um, programs uh, implemented in eight out of the 10 cities, including Salt Lake City, Provo, West Valley, Park City, Ogden, Sandy, West Jordan, and Lehigh. And to qualify homeowners um, are often first time homeowners and they must um, intend to use the uh, property as a primary residence, of course, and uh, they must commit to um, living in the house for a period of time, usually it's two years, 
And if they don't, they might have a, a penalty. And there are some cities that also provide uh, zero interest loans um, that could be uh, 10,000, uh, for example, for a down payment for a first time home buyer. Uh, the, the next tool, and I, I'm, I'm going to return to what I said originally, this, this is research that was done by our students. Um, they, they did interviews with uh, local planners. They went through the uh, moderate income housing elements and so on. And it's possible we got some of these wrong. I think we found a, a few discrepancies in the last 24 hours. So our apologies if we did. We made a, a big effort, the students did, to get good information. Um, so preservation of long-term affordable housing, housing rehabilitation programs, uh, often uh, given by cities in the form of a loan to a homeowner that may uh, not be able to pay for repairs, uh, maintenance, upkeep. Um, they can be used for everything from plumbing repair uh, to increasing energy efficiency of units. All cities in Utah, uh, except, except Oran, according to our survey, uh, apply programs of this sort. Uh, Salt Lake City purchases existing multifamily structures, such as hotels, motels, or apartment complexes, and redevelops those units as affordable housing while operating structural renovation programs to reduce utility, energy, and maintenance costs. Lehigh uh, encourages upkeep of existing housing stock through several policies, in, including utilization of state and federal funds or tax incentives and uh, my, is part of its moderate income housing element. Um, Park City, 122 uh, uh, units were rehabilitated and upgraded uh, using gap loans from the city. Uh, our national example is, since, is, is Prince, Prince George's County in Maryland, which operates a, a single family housing rehabilitation loan program that provides financing to low income uh, individuals to upgrade aging and substandard homes. And I wanted to um, mention, there was like a question in the chat um, about like mobile home parks and um, how the affordability was like being lost. And Reed was mentioning the housing trust funds could be really good um, for actually like transforming um, motels and, and hotels. So there's a, a lot of research of like how also um, actually like the city could buy from uh, the mobile home park uh, owner um, that um, property. And sometimes it, they might use like eminent domain um, to do that, but housing trust funds um, are, are, are really good for that kind of development. Um, so the, I um, actually like before moving to Utah, I was in Chicago and did an extensive evaluation of the uh, Chicago housing trust funds. Um, there I learned that like housing trust funds are very flexible so they can be implemented at any scale uh, from cities to states, and they can provide uh, low-cost loans um, for uh, brand new units um, or rehabs. Um, they can also provide um, direct subsidies to tenants, so similar to the housing choice voucher or the rapid rehousing program uh, for homeless individuals. Uh, you can have like participating landlords that are only have one unit. Um, really helping them to avoid um, foreclosures if they have like, uh, for example, um, two units um, in where they live. Um, they can be like funded in very flexible ways. So with like uh, property taxes, uh, cigarette taxes, uh, taxes for ga gas or boats. Um, and as I said, they could be used for homeowners, uh, renters, and also homeless um, individuals. Here in Utah, we have a housing trust fund. It's called the Olin uh, Walker Housing uh, Loan Fund. Um, and uh, it, it like serve um, families at the 40% um, of the uh, area median income. And the, the same year, um, it uh, re rehab like 800 multifamily units and also like 85 uh, single family homes. 
Um, Salt Lake City has a, a housing trust fund that has been around since like um, 2000. And um, it provides like uh, loans to uh, housing sponsors and developers for um, affordable and special needs housing in Salt Lake City. Uh, so it, it provides um, ownership units um, through the Mountain Lands Community Housing Trust and also um, um, for Habitat for, for Humanity um, in Park City specifically. And in Park City also there's a housing resolution, housing obligations units. Um, and these are privately financed and have produced um, both like long-term renters, but also like owner occupied um, unit, units. And there's like several cities that are thinking about uh, creating a housing trust fund. Lehigh is one of them, but they haven't finalized any kind of agreement. Hey, um, I, I think we're uh, watching uh, the time here. We're probably going to have to speed it up a little bit. So I'll, I'll see if I can go through mine a little faster. Um, so the community land trusts, uh, trusts are the uh, next tool. Two of 10 cities um, yeah, that we surveyed uh, have these land trusts to retain land that is set aside for affordable housing, the land bought by the trust is kept affordable and sheltered from uh, rising land prices in the market. Uh, qualified low-income homeowners own title to the house, but typically have a renewable long-term ground lease uh, for the land. And that, that's how uh, the city keeps the, uh, the, the cost of housing down by, by not allowing appreciation of the land. Uh, Salt Lake City has a community land trust. Um, uh, Utah County is in the process. We were told in our survey of setting one up like the one in Provo and Provo. Um, Chapel Hill is one of our national examples. Burlington, Vermont, another one, Durham, North Carolina, uh, and Albuquerque. And, and by the way, uh, I haven't said this, but when you uh, go to the, uh, to the uh, manual, uh, the affordable housing manual uh, or guide, um, there are lots of references and these references will allow you to look into the individual tools in much greater detail than we can. So the next tools are policy tools. So these are more planning tools such as updating the zoning code and uh, for base um, codes. Yeah, so um, upzoning is done in, as, you, as you'd expect, in all a 10 out of 10 uh, cities at some point or another in some place or another. Um, it doesn't always lead to affordable housing, as you all know. Uh, the units along 400 South, for example, aren't particularly affordable. They're certainly not affordable for low-income households. Um, so um, it's not a guarantee, but it, it at least creates the possibility of greater affordability because the cost of land is, is amortized over more units when, when an upzoning occurs. Um, I, I would love to talk about Provo and Orem using a student and senior housing zoning overlays to create more affordable housing. Uh, I'm going to, though, skip to uh, the national example, which is one that I know you're, you're all familiar with and just fascinating. Uh, Minneapolis uh, just passed a comprehensive plan amendment, which uh, rezones all single family uh, housing uh, uh, properties uh, for up to triplexes. So in theory, tripling uh, the density ultimately of a uh, single family neighborhood. Uh, politically, obviously a tough thing to do, but it's, uh, it's impressive nonetheless. Uh, Form-based goals, um, they differ from registration zoning um, in that they focus on the form of development over the use of land. So the form is decided in the context of the overall look and feel of the community. So this codes uh, stipulate standards uh, for design elements, including but not limited to facades, the relationship of one building to another building, and the scale uh, of buildings and blocks, 
Um, so usually form-based codes are um, used in areas where they might be close to transit uh, or where there's density. Um, so this is a way to encourage uh, more um, affordable housing, um, thinking that um, how like communities can uh, grow in a smart uh, manner. And the city of um, South Salt Lake passed uh, form-based codes in their East Streetcar neighborhood in 2014. Um, and as a result of the change, there was uh, several multifamily housing units that have been developed along the corridor with a, a mix of like market rate and some affordable housing units. Um, and Park City and Salt Lake City have also implemented uh, four base codes in selected areas as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so inclusionary zoning is sort of my favorite uh, tool. Um, I uh, was before I came out here in the East where it's, it's much more common. Uh, it, it requires developers to build a certain percentage of affordable housing in their market rate projects. So you have mixed income, affordable and, and market rate in the same project. Um, it uh, uh, usually requires something between 10 and 20% of the units uh, to be affordable. Uh, it's often combined with other things like density bonuses. So yes, the developer has to uh, provide some affordable housing, but ultimately gets to build more because of a, a density bonus. Uh, Park City, and I hope we're right about this, is the only municipality in our study um, to have inclusionary zoning uh, from 2005 to 2011. Uh, 78 affordable housing units were built in response to this requirement. Uh, our national examples, uh, one of them, uh, one's New York, it's 20% uh, affordable is, is sort of standard. Uh, it was the requirement in the original program. One that I'm much more familiar with is Montgomery County, Maryland, because I, I lived, I, I was at the University of Maryland before I moved out here and uh, had actually saw these these units, uh, they are almost uh, under the moderately priced dwelling unit program. They're, they're almost indistinguishable from the market rate uh, units. Not 100%, but very small differences in the same housing cluster. Uh, and they've had it since uh, 1973. They've had this program and they produced over 12,000 affordable units. So read our talked about uh, density bonuses. So an example that he was um, giving of inclusionary zoning, for example, if I'm asking you as a developer to uh, make 20% of the units affordable, um, what I, if you, for example, were only allowed um, as in the normal zoning to build 35 units, maybe now uh, with this density bonus, you can build additional 10 units and have like 45 um, units. So there's like six cities that allow density bonus, uh, Salt Lake City, South Salt Lake, Orem, Park City, Ogden, and Lehigh. Um, and I found a very nice example in Lehigh um, of these homes that were called the Beehive Homes. Um, and this was a very small project. Um, so they were allowed to build um, a units, a big bot, or they in the normal zoning, but then with the density bonus, they were allowed to build 16 uh, units and they are for um, older adults. So that was a very nice uh, project to find. So uh, this one may strike you as a little odd or different, but reducing parking requirements uh, is a, an affordable housing program. Um, yeah, you, you all know um, from conferences and, and things you've read that uh, structured parking is really expensive. Um, I've seen uh, numbers ranging up to $50,000 uh, per uh, structured parking space. Uh, it's usually between, between 20 and 30. Um, so that's a cost that is necessarily passed on to, uh, to renters and it makes housing less affordable. Um, so uh, for example, uh, in San Francisco, one of the projects we highlight uh, would, was required, would have been required to build 130 to 190 parking spaces 
but constructed only 85 spaces. And that represents, of course, a savings. That was right next to high quality public transit. One, one thing we've done a lot of, and I think Ted Knowlton has supported uh, our work in this is looking at, at TODs, transit oriented developments around the country. And uh, we've looked at now seven of them, done detailed studies, case studies, and uh, they typically with, um, with unbundled parking, uh, they typically require about one space per unit in contrast to um, the localities uh, in, in this region that almost always require two spaces per unit. And that's obviously an added cost and uh, it thwarts affordability. And the next strategy is like preserving existing deed um, restrictions on in affordable housing. So there's like six of 10 cities that um, use this strategy. Uh, Salt Lake City, Provo, Park City, Sandy, West Jordan, and Lehigh. Um, and these site deed restriction, restrictions are usually related to community land trusts uh, or co-ops. So to avoid that the units are sold at the market rate, the local housing agency or maybe the nonprofit um, that is like managing the co-op or community land trust is given the right to oversee like the transaction um, that is happening between the one that sells and buys. Um, and there's like a new buyback and sale program that was created um, by pa Park City uh, Council in 2017. And the city holds a first right to purchase on all deed restricted properties. And the city has begun to exercise this right by purchasing properties uh, with outdated uh, deed restrictions, uh, updating the deed restrictions and then selling them um, to uh, qualified um, buyers. And as Reed previously discussed, um, Salt Lake City has a community land trust and Provo is in the process of funding one. So it'd be important to preserve these uh, deed restrictions. So uh, we're running out of time. And uh, Angela, um, how would you like us to handle this? Uh, everyone's going to get the, um, you know, the, the guide, uh, we could just go very quickly through the remaining tools, maybe just mention them and add a sentence uh, to it, or we could uh, stop at this point and assume everyone's going to have a chance to read it. What would you like to do? Why don't you quickly through the slides um, with maybe a sentence, and then uh, maybe we can keep panelists on for you know, a few extra minutes to just answer a few of the questions that have come in, if that works for you guys. Yes, yeah, okay, so real real quickly, uh, create accessory, uh, accessory dwelling units. Uh, it's one of the oldest, simplest ideas, just allow uh, granny flats and mother-in-law units uh, uh, above garages uh, and separate uh, backyard uh, houses. Um, in theory, doubles the density um, of, of a neighborhood that allows it, uh, uh, I, I believe, uh, seven of 10 of the uh, places we surveyed uh, allow ADUs. I, I, so we talk about Salt Lake City's program and Sandy's program. I'm not going to talk about that, um, uh, but uh, we'll say that Santa Cruz, California, uh, revised its zoning ordinance in 2002 uh, to allow accessory units everywhere and did something that is different, which is why I'm bringing it up. They, they created a loan program for loans of up to 100,000 at a low interest rate uh, for uh, any homeowner who wants to create an accessory dwelling unit. So we all know that um, time is money. So if you can uh, fast track a construction permit for an affordable housing developer, that's a great idea. Um, there's uh, the South Salt Lake City and Provo and Salt Lake City uh, offers um, this site like, permitting system. Um, I wanted to mention that in, in Salt Lake City, there's a transit station area design guidelines and it is based also on a, on a hundred points um, uh, that you have to get and you get 60 points um, to like towards the fast tracking if you provide some kind of uh, affordable housing. 
Okay, so the next slide is just one of those table slides. And remember that a check means a local government has a tool and an X means it doesn't. And once again, there are a lot of, a lot of Xs. Uh, we're referring to this as social or other tools, uh, which is a little funny, but we couldn't think of a better way to describe it. So one of those other tools is the employer assistant uh, housing, uh, which is practiced in um, Salt Lake City, uh, Provo, um, and also like Park uh, City. And um, so I think you, Ari was uh, talking about like how uh, you can maintain, um, for example, teachers um, in your uh, community. So the, the Park City, actually um, the city itself, wants to keep the teachers uh, within the boundaries of Park City. And as you know, Park City is very expensive. Um, so it actually like provides um, assistance in down payments um, and other types of assistance um, so teachers can become homeowners uh, within the district. So the next one is public-private partnerships. Uh, and six of the 10 cities reported that they have these partnerships with uh, private parties. Um, there are uh, good examples in Salt Lake. We, uh, for example, uh, highlight the Redevelopment Agency of Salt Lake, which proved uh, 3.2 million for the housing assistance uh, management enterprise uh, company to purchase and develop four parcels uh, on the 1700 South Block of State Street. Um, the national examples, Austin, uh, really cool energy efficient homes that have been built through a partnership. Uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, is another example we, we give in the um, the separate section for national examples. And the next strategy is like how to transform uh, not in my backyard movement into like, yes, in my backyard. Um, and that happens like through a lot of education. Um, like for example, the Utah Housing Coalition putting these kinds of um, events and many others to educate uh, the public about the importance of affordable housing. And we found like four cities that are really good at this. Uh, Salt Lake City, Orem, Ogden, and Park City, and you can find uh, more detailed examples in the report. So, so uh, city public housing, we cities, uh, uh, three out of 10 uh, own housing. Uh, and um, uh, what we're not referring to here is necessarily, uh, you know, federal public uh, subsidized housing uh, with a housing authority um, uh, administering uh, the, the housing, but where the local government actually owns housing. Uh, we, we have uh, three examples of that. Um, and and I, I'm not quite sure about the three, if they're like this, but Provo has the Provo City Housing Authority. Uh, and we talk about uh, its output uh, since 1981 when it was uh, created, uh, where the rents are 30% of gross adjusted household income. And uh, that uh, is what makes it affordable. So Ari and Ted were talking about the importance of thinking about um, housing and transportation. So usually you will pay like 30% um, towards like housing and about 20% of transportation. Uh, but if you live in a place that is like transit rich, you can really reduce those transportation costs. Um, and so this like housing plus transportation way of thinking, it can be very helpful for policymakers. Um, like it's being used in Salt Lake City, Salt, Salt Lake, Provo, Ogden, Sandy, and Lehigh um, to, make, to add more density uh, where transit um, is located. But also it could be a great uh, tool for consumers and people to make uh, decisions about where they live. So we're doing a study right now of the affordability of TOD um, around the country. And uh, the H plus T framework is what we're using. So housing uh, cost is affordable if it's less than 30% of income. Uh, transportation considered affordable if it's less than 15%. And these TODs 
uh, we're finding, and, and this will end our presentation, um, are, are pricey, not, not in terms of transportation. They, the transportation costs are, are low and people own fewer automobiles than typical in the United States and so on. But the housing is typically for moderate income uh, households, not for low income. So that's why it's so important to have inclusionary housing or inclusionary uh, zoning. And the last thing I'm gonna say before I turn it back to Angela is just that uh, I mentioned before that the references are throughout this report. Uh, they're, they're almost all online. If you wanna learn about more about these, just go to the references uh, and, uh, and learn about what's happening around the country. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you guys so much. What a great report um, from the City and Metropolitan Planning Department. And thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. Um, we're a few minutes over. We've gotten a few questions um, regarding the ability to view this again and if the chat and links will be copied and sent to the participants. Um, I'm hearing from the Utah Housing Coalition who um, has so graciously hosted us today that they will be um, sending the presentation and a copy of the chat with the links out to the participants. And you can also view this presentation on their website, uh, or I'm sorry, by Googling um, uh, Utah Housing Coalition through the YouTube channel and going to their um, YouTube channel to, to view this presentation. Um, do you guys have time to take a quick question or two? Do you wanna um, stop the screen sharing for a minute, please? And we can get all the panelists up. And then do you guys have a minute to answer a few questions? I sure we surely do. Okay. Let's maybe take uh, let's take maybe five minutes or less and answer a few of the questions here. Um, there was a question about the Salt Lake City data from Wendelin. Wendelin, I posted that in the chat, so hopefully you were able to retrieve that. Um, there's a question that um, from Natalie that is Will the president's um, repeal of the um, affirmatively furthering fair housing rule um, act that may be mixed up affect states mandates or municipalities responsibility to help provide affordable housing? I am hoping it doesn't, but what else would that act protect? Tara, this seems like maybe your bailiwick, but anyone else feel free to chime in. Well, I think at this point, um we're moving in a different direction here in our state. Um, I believe that um, because of the pandemic um, that we're looking at housing in a much different way. And also in a lot of the policies that we have um, put together in terms of you know, allocating our tax credits and, and making sure that um, these projects are in higher opportunity areas. Um, I think that is extremely helpful. Um, it does scare me. And, and also some of the rhetoric about, um, you know, housing property values, um, you know, which is a myth, um, you know, we got some work to do on that. And so, you know, we have to hold tight and, um, you know, make sure that we don't you know, buy into the whole, not in my backyard. Um, you know, I see us, especially with the report that we just saw from Envision Utah and what people are preferring. Um, I mean, that to me is really impressive. And so I don't know if that answered your question because it really scares me um, that that happened. Uh, definitely. Um not, not some great, great news today when we have a lot of um, equity issues happening in our country. Correct. Um, we have another okay. question here from uh, Paul Larson. Our school district is on the verge of adopting a policy that would make use of TIF very difficult for housing. Are any other participants experiencing that? Panels, have you guys heard of any other issues related to that? I, I haven't, um, but open that up if anybody has any remarks there. Um, this is Tara, this, I appreciate the heads up on that and I, I'm gonna get with Steve Erickson and, and talk to him. What school district is that, did Paul, they say? Uh, Paul's in uh, what, uh, Northern Utah, Ted saved me here. 
<laughs> Cash County. Fox <laughs> Elder. Ben, you're muted. <laughs> we can't get Ted unmuted, but um, Tara, I'll follow up with you. Paul Larson's pretty active with the legislative committee. So let me, I'm, I'm blanking on where he's from right now. Um, okay, from Lonnie, we have uh, the local rent assistance tool could in theory be an ongoing, ongoing program. I see no Utah cities have this. Did you find other somewhat comparable in size to Utah cities in other states? Um, we, we each of the, um... Each of the tools has examples from other states. So, so the standard layout is what is the tool, how, how is it funded, and so on and so forth. The last section uh, is always um, national examples. And the, uh, I, I forgot to mention this. I, I'll only take 30 seconds, but um, uh, Jim Wood at Chem Gardner is preparing a best practice manual for affordable housing. Uh, and the purpose of ours is to sort of dis start a discussion and give you some examples, including out of state examples. Uh, his will be, I'm sure, uh, much more authoritative. Uh, I don't know where he is on that, but I do know uh, from talking to him that he's, he's been working on it for a long time these best case examples is what he's what he's putting together okay thank you um, um i mean for the the housing um trust funds um there's like some cases in where like they provide like rental assistance so that's an opportunity here in utah because right now we don't have um that and also rental assistance <laughs> in many cases could be offered for people that are actually like um homeless um, which are like, you know, extremely um, low income. Um, so that's also a, a, an opportunity um, as well, because those like funds tend to be like extremely flexible. Ted, go ahead, sorry. Angela, there's, there is a lot of uh, great questions about NIMBYs and, and what do you do? And this is, uh, first of all, NIMBY concerns are valid. Okay, they are. Um, but they are narrow. They are they are they are parochial. They're about the impacts on me, but not on the impacts on the housing market, and not on the even on the impacts on the city at large. And I, I if I were to um, suggest a couple of uh, thoughts on this, one is that it's it's a good strategy for a city to have a big uh, public inclusive um, process to talk about housing policy at the same time that they have their biggest policy questions, kind of like a general plan. And then from that, steal up and decide what you're gonna do. You have involved a broad group of people, not just NIMBYs, but a lot of people that are affected. You've decided what to do, now do it. That's really the kind of, that's what you have to do. Otherwise, those that are negatively affected will always um, be louder than the silent uh, uh, group of people that may benefit from more housing, housing in, good lo in locations that, that reduce costs for people of limited means. And so have a big engagement process. Listen to everybody, listen to NIMBYs, listen to the whole spectrum, make a plan, follow it. The other thing is that there is a malady that is super common among uh, uh, local governments. It's so understandable, which is this. You know, affordable housing may make sense in the town next to me, but not so much in our town. I think maybe town X just down the road, they can deal with it. And the problem is that same thinking is happening in the town down the road and it's happening in the town up the road. And I think um, elected officials have to ask themselves, what is really our share here? And you know, if we don't do it, 
How can we expect another community to do it? We have to ask these questions of basic fairness. And it's the reason, very reason why the Obama administration put in place the uh, 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 affirming fair housing rule that uh, the Trump administration is uh, taking down is they're saying, look, think about fairness. Consider, consider what is a fair thing to do and then act on that. And, you know, I think it's a fair principle. With that, I mean, I can't, I can't be the El Presidente Ted with that drop the mic speech there. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, thank our panelists, thank Professor Ewing and Garcia for their work. Um, we are so grateful to have entities like Envision Utah, WFRC, Utah Housing Coalition here in Utah. I think it's what makes the work that we do is so much more pleasurable and so much more impactful. So thank you guys so much for your hard work, for sharing your ideas and your experience with us all today. Um, feel free to visit the Utah Housing Coalition YouTube channel for a recording of this video. And I'm seeing Francisca is going to send out um, the, the presentation and the chat to everybody. So thanks again, have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, hi.